When you think of the beginning of the UFO and alien craze in United States history, your mind probably goes straight to Roswell, New Mexico in 1947. But what if I told you reports of unidentified flying objects, including Tic Tac UFOs, flying saucers, and metallic spheres were reported throughout the 1800s? What if I told you that the belief in the possibility of alien life was already being discussed and that some of our founding fathers here in the States even believed in a densely inhabited universe? Well, my name is Riley and welcome back to Paranormal Community College. And today we're talking about the mystery airships of the 1800s. And I'm really excited to talk about this today because I think it's one of the lesser known aspects of UFO lore. But before I begin, if you'd like to support the show and if you like the episode, I'd greatly appreciate it if you could leave me a review and hit that follow or subscribe button. So the earliest recorded possible UFO sighting occurred in the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1639. On March 1st, 1639, Governor John Winthrop wrote in his diary that a man by the name of James Everill, who he described as a sober, discreet man, along with two other men, encountered something strange while rowing along the muddy river. They apparently saw a strange, luminous object in the sky. This is an excerpt from Governor Winthrop's diary. When it stood still, it flamed up and was about three yards square. When it ran, it was contracted into the figure of a swine. For about two or three hours, the men said it moved swiftly as an arrow. It traveled across a two-mile radius, and Winthrop further records that diverse other credible persons saw the same light after about the same place. The three boatmen ultimately found themselves stunned because after the event had happened, they found that they had traveled about one mile upstream with no recollection of having rowed against the tide. The computer scientist and internet pioneer turned ufologist Jacques Vallée contends that this could very well be one of the earliest written accounts of missing time accompanied by an alleged UFO sighting, far before the term UFO even existed. This wouldn't be the only anomalous event Winthrop would record, however. Just five years later, in 1644, Winthrop wrote that three boatmen claimed to see two strange lights rise out of the water and float towards the land, only to disappear shortly after. Just a week later, Winthrop writes again, A light like the moon arose about the northeastern point in Boston and met the former at Noddles Island. And there they closed in one and then parted and closed and parted diverse times and so went over the hill in the island and vanished. Sometimes they shot out flames and sometimes sparkles. This was about eight of the clock in the evening and was seen by many. About the same time, a voice was heard upon the water between Boston and Dorchester, calling out in a most dreadful manner, boy, boy, come away, come away and it suddenly shifted from one place to another a great distance, about 20 times. It was heard by diverse, godly persons. About 14 days after, the same voice in the same dreadful manner was heard by others on the other side of the town towards Noddles Island. So you're probably thinking, well, we all know that the Puritans were a bunch of superstitious weirdos who decided to execute 19 people for the crime of witchcraft in 1692. However, The Puritans, especially a governor such as Winthrop, as religiously radical as they were, were notably educated individuals. John Winthrop graduated from Trinity College in Cambridge, where he studied law. He was educated just as any noble Englishman would have been in the 17th century, as would many of his Puritan compatriots who settled in Massachusetts. In his diary, he does try to use scientific reasoning to explain these events and takes the objective position of someone who is simply recording a curious event. He doesn't even hint that this is of the devil or supernatural, just an odd or unexplainable occurrence. But things don't start getting really interesting until the 19th century, so let's begin in the year 1800 with none other than Thomas Jefferson. Now in the year 1800, Jefferson was working as the president of the American Philosophical Society. In one of his publications entitled Descriptions of a Singular Phenomenon Seen at Baton Rouge, Thomas Jefferson writes, Phenomenon was seen to pass Baton Rouge on the night of the 5th of April of 1800, of which the following is the best description I have been able to obtain. It was first seen in the southwest and moved so rapidly, passing over the heads of the spectators, as to disappear in the northeast in about a quarter of a minute. It appeared to be the size of a large house, 70 or 80 feet long, It appeared to be about 200 yards above the surface, wholly luminous, but not emitting sparks. It was of a color resembling the sun near the horizon in a cold, frosty evening, which may be called a crimson red. 
When passing right over the heads of the spectators, the light on the surface of the earth was little short of the effect of sunbeams. Though, at the same time, looking another way, the stars were visible, which appears to be a confirmation of the opinion formed of its moderate elevation. In passing, a considerable degree of heat was felt, but no electric sensation. Immediately after it disappeared in the northeast, a violent rushing noise was heard, as if the phenomenon was bearing down the forest before it and in a few seconds a tremendous crash was heard similar to that of the largest piece of ordnance, causing a very sensible earthquake. I have been informed that search has been made in the place where the burning body fell and that a considerable portion of the surface of the earth was found broken up and every vegetable body burned or greatly scorched. I have not yet received answers to a number of queries I have sent on, which may perhaps bring to light more particulars. Thomas Jefferson traveled from Natchez, Mississippi to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where this event occurred, to personally talk to witness William Dunbar himself. His detailed description of whatever this was is impressive, and remember, this is happening in the wake of the Enlightenment. This was a time of science and reason, not superstition. There was something about this event that intrigued Jefferson and others, and if it was just a meteor, it may have been the first considerable one witnessed as a new nation. What's interesting is how he said it lit up the earth below like a sunbeam, and that it was at a relatively low elevation. The lack of sparks seems to be mentioned as if to say this didn't appear to be a meteor, but the rate of speed it was moving at and the crashing noise heard does sound more like a meteor, so who knows. He also doesn't say if anything spectacular was found at the potential crash site. Broken up earth does sound more like it could have been a natural celestial object of some kind, There was no report of strange metals or other strange materials typically described in alleged UFO crashes, but Jefferson seemed interested as if this was an exceptional case. And in this very century, we may have a couple actual UFO crashes. Many enlightened individuals at this time, including Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson, made serious inquiries into the possibility of life on other planets. They never claimed, as far as we know, that these strange things seen in the sky were from another planet or another world, but they did believe in what they called the plurality of worlds, a surprisingly ancient theory that suggests life exists on other planets and moons, and that life is ubiquitous throughout the entire universe. Now, there are some stories from the 1700s, or at least they supposedly took place during the 1700s, but they weren't published until well into the 19th century, so I didn't really want to mention them because they seem like 100% made up. Like, there's one where um, George Washington encounters, quite literally, a little green man in the woods. Um, And there's other, like, supposed UFO sightings during the Revolutionary War. It's just all of those stories came out, like, well into the 1800s. So they're kind of published way after the fact. It's really not until the mid to late 1800s that people start reporting these so-called mystery airships. One of the first possible UFO sightings during this period that I could find anyway comes from Burick College in Tennessee on June 1st, 1853. In the early morning, while the sun was still rising, students claimed to see two round objects in the sky. One was described as looking like a new moon, while the other was luminous. They seemed to grow bigger and then smaller in size and went back and forth like this. Also, one would light up and the other would turn dark and they went back and forth like this in this fashion for a few minutes before completely disappearing. Was it a UFO? I'm not sure, but the students at Burick College thought it was rather strange. It is interesting how they seem to be growing and shrinking, lighting up and then going dark. I'm not aware of any meteor or other celestial object or atmospheric phenomenon that acts like that, and there shouldn't have been any man-made craft like a satellite up there, so... At any rate, it is quite mysterious. A more remarkable event occurred in Wilmington, Delaware on July 13, 1860. A 200-foot-long object was witnessed by several individuals slowly floating through town at only about 100 feet above the ground. Trailing behind this strange craft were, quote, very red and glowing balls. And a force shot out of the rear of the object, quote, giving off sparkles after the manner of a rocket. From beneath the craft emanated a pale blue light that lit up the ground below as it slowly hovered over the town. 
This one is quite weird as it seems as if it was moving at a moderate or even slow speed and the pale blue light and very red and glowing balls trailing the craft also seems odd. Again, doesn't sound like a meteor. Many skeptics at this time claimed people were simply mistaking these airships for planets because, yeah, super easy to mistake a planet high up in the night sky for something floating slowly over the town. The first account of a mystery airship in those direct terms took place in Montana in 1865 by James Lumley near Cadot Pass, which is now the modern-day Continental Divide Trail between Rogers Pass and Highway 200. His story is recorded as such. Just after sunset one evening, he beheld a bright luminous body in the heavens which was moving with a great rapidity in an easterly direction. It was plainly visible for at least five seconds when it suddenly separated into particles resembling, as Mr. Lumley described it, the bursting of a skyrocket in the air. A few minutes later, Lumley heard an explosion that jarred the earth followed by a rumbling sound he said sounded like a tornado sweeping through the forest. There followed a strong wind and a peculiar sulfur smell that filled the air. He saw a trail of destruction the next day. Great and widespread havoc was everywhere visible. He claimed he saw a rock among the debris that was divided into compartments labeled with curious hieroglyphics. He said the material resembled glass and that there was a dark liquid throughout the area. The stone itself, although but a fragment of an immense body, must have been used for some purpose by animated beings. The newspaper writer states, quote, strange as this story appears, Mr. Lumley relates it with such sincerity that we are forced to accept it as true. Okay, so there's a couple interesting aspects of this story. So of course it happened over a hundred years ago. We have no way of knowing if it was entirely made up or what kind of person Mr. Lumley was. Although he could have been the first person to create a UFO crash story, so who knows? But let's look at this in context of some modern UFO crash sites or alleged UFO crash sites. One thing that stood out to me was the sulfur smell. That sulfur smell is so often mentioned in close encounters and UFO crashes. If you're familiar with the Virginia UFO incident in Brazil, you know what I mean. But the sulfur smell could also be from something totally natural like a meteor perhaps. But we all want it to be aliens, let's face it. And how many times do witnesses claim to see strange markings that they specifically describe as hieroglyphics? The Rendlesham Forest incident, the Kecksburg UFO incident, and the highly credible Lonnie Zamora encounter, to name a few. Now, him describing the debris being like glass is different. So often we get that indestructible foil material. But the debris and liquid he describes as being spread out across a vast area, that is common, but of course, this could have been a meteor. But it's the rock with compartments and writing on it that is so curious, and his conviction that it had to have been made by animated beings. And the way the journalist says that he relates the story with such sincerity that we are forced to accept it as true. This is such another common theme of outrageous UFO and alien experiences, no one wants to believe them. Their story sounds too crazy. But if they're lying, they deserve an Oscar. Whether it's their body language, their tone of voice, their genuine look of fear and distress and confusion, some of these witnesses are hard not to believe. But also, like, if I'm a prospector or whatever in Montana in the 1800s and I come across a strange rock with hieroglyphics on it, and that has multiple compartments and looks to be made by animated beings, like, I would take it with me. <laughs> I, I And then show it to people so I could prove my story. But did he do that? I don't think so. In the mid-1860s to 1870s, a wave of mystery airships were allegedly experienced by several people throughout Kansas. One of these occurrences was recorded in a folk song, and part of the lyrics go like this. And I'm sorry, I'm not going to sing this to you because trust me, you don't want me to. Twas on a dark night in 66 when we was laying still, we seen a flying engine without no wing or no wheel. It came a roaring in the sky with lights along the side and scales like a serpent's hide. Now, one of the weird things when we get into some later stories in a bit is the material of these crafts or phenomenon or whatever they were is often described as serpentine or scaly, like an alligator. 
that's definitely not how we typically describe UFOs today. We typically describe them as being metallic or perhaps just luminous or like a bright light. I don't know if this is maybe a case of where the vernacular of the day or the sociocultural lingo or ways in which they described potential UFOs was just different, and describing them as scaly maybe made sense to them. But it is interesting this folk song describes it as a flying engine and that it came a-roaring through the sky. UFOs are sometimes described as silent, sometimes they are described as emitting a whirring noise, and other times they are said to be loud and make engine-like or mechanical noises. We're going to step away from the U.S. for a second to talk about something that occurred in Chile in April of 1868. Witnessed in the sky was something strange and unidentifiable, and they described it like this. On its body, elongated like a serpent, we could see brilliant scales, which clashed together like a metallic sound as the strange animal turned its body in flight. Again, they've used that serpentine vocabulary. In this case, it's described as some kind of animal. But people in Chile weren't the only ones who likened an unknown flying thing to that of an animal. In Bonham, Texas, in 1873, something described as a large silvery serpent was seen in the sky, and then seen the following day in Fort Scott, Texas. In Denison, Texas, in 1878, a man by the name of John Martin claimed he saw an object in the sky that was about the size of an orange, but got bigger and bigger as it got closer. He described it as looking like about the size of a large saucer. This was reported in three different newspapers and could possibly be the first time a UFO is described as saucer-shaped. Perhaps Kenneth Arnold was not the first person to describe it in that fashion in 1947. A newspaper in Tombstone, Arizona, yes, the Tombstone, published an article on April 26, 1890, entitled, A Strange Winged Monster Discovered and Killed in the Huachuca Desert. The article says, A winged monster resembling a large alligator with an extremely long tail and immense pair of wings was found on the desert between the Whetstone and Huachuca Mountains by two ranchers who were returning home. The creature was evidently greatly exhausted by a long flight and when discovered was able to fly, but a short distance at a time. They claimed to pursue the creature at close range, trying to get close enough to shoot at it. Upon being shot, the creature allegedly tried to fight back, but eventually rolled over and remained motionless. They claimed it measured 92 feet in length. Greatest diameter was about 50 inches. It had two feet. Its head was eight feet long. Sharp teeth, eyes were as large as dinner plates, had a wingspan of 160 feet. Thick and nearly transparent membrane, devoid of feathers or hair, it was easily penetrated by a bullet, and apparently they cut off a small tip of the wing as a souvenir, which they said they sent back east for scientists. Now, if this story sounds a bit sus, well, it should, because it most likely, probably, almost 100% did not happen. But there were a bunch of these so-called Thunderbird sightings during this period. Some guy in the 1930s actually said that it had been him, that they did try to chase it down, but that the horses were spooked and they were forced to turn around. They never tried to shoot it down. They were frightened themselves and they told people about it and it became bigger than it was. Now, not only is this a time of sensationalized stories in the newspapers, but People also knew about dinosaurs and pterosaurs by this time. This could have been a super elaborate story to further add to the allure of Tombstone, Arizona. And even back in the day, maybe people wanted dinosaurs to be real. But the story eventually reaches Lake Elizabeth, California, where people also claim to have seen the same creature. Now, I know these aren't really UFO stories, but they're still interesting and still unidentified flying animals of some kind or just fanciful stories that are fun to imagine against the Wild West cowboy backdrop. Cowboys and aliens and flying monsters. So Lake Elizabeth is near Palmdale, California, and there had been local legends that the devil himself created the lake as a home for one of his pets. Even the Spaniards called it Laguna del Diablo, or Lake of the Devil. Located on the San Andreas Fault, it was believed that you could swim to the underworld through Lake Elizabeth, a strange flying creature resembling the Thunderbird seen in Tombstone had been seen between 1833 and 1866. 
When Morris Settlement began in the 1850s, people claimed to be tormented by strange screams at night, unnatural noises, visions, and other events they apparently refused to talk about, so they left. Two men, Don Chico Vasquez and Don Chico Lopez, eventually built a ranch on the lake. They claimed that workers began reporting missing livestock and seeing dark shadows in the sky at night. They claimed that whatever it was, their bullets bounced off its hide. The workers eventually quit out of fear and the two Don Chicos were forced to sell. And what is interesting about the workers' claims is you have something flying in the sky that is impenetrable, impenetrable by bullets and livestock is also going missing. Is this reminding anyone of the Skinwalker Ranch episode? because we all know aliens are obsessed with livestock for some reason. And it's indeed a flying animal large enough to carry off cattle and also bulletproof, so that's kind of terrifying. They even have their own lake monster, like at Bottle Hollow Reservoir. But anyway, they sell it to a man named Miguel Leonis, who was apparently so badass, he was able to fend the creature off with the butt of his rifle, thus terrifying the monster so much that it flew away, never to return again. At least, that's what he said. Now, I know there's a lot of Native American legends about the Thunderbirds, but after reading up on them a bit and seeing the diversity from tribe to tribe, I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole of trying to argue that these Thunderbirds were mechanical craft, ancient alien style. But in general, they seem to be animal spirits of great power, according to the Native Americans. And these Thunderbirds, in some cases, even taught the natives important skills and protected them from evil spirits. The Thunderbird story that came out of the Wild West days is just interesting because it does appear so often throughout the American Southwest during the 1800s. And I know we all want to believe in cowboys and aliens because that's just fun, but who knows? It could totally be a game of telephone that just got out of hand. It doesn't seem to be mechanical, although some say its hide was impenetrable by bullet. Others say, well, probably was a dinosaur because that's not as crazy as a flying saucer. Or maybe it was just an unknown large bird of prey that, already on the brink of extinction and unknown to science, could have disappeared altogether. But as I mentioned before, it wasn't just in the States that strange things were being noticed in the sky. On August 12, 1883, Mexican astronomer Jose Bonilla was preparing his telescope at the newly opened Zacatecas Observatory. As he was preparing to study the sun, he noticed that the disk of the sun seemed partially blocked. He said there were numerous objects, unknown to him, that were darting around at great speed across the sun. He took 450 photos of this event, which were provided to the public two years later. He claimed they were fuzzy and misty in nature and that they had, quote, ducktails. Some of his photos, along with his description, were published in the French astronomy magazine L'Astronomie. The magazine's publisher, physicist Camille Flammarion, dismissed his pictures of being, as being birds or insects or dust because he couldn't conclude what they might have been either. Now, there was an American by the name of Charles Fort who wrote about various anomalous activity around this time period, including UFOs. He interviewed various amateur astronomers who claimed to see objects such as this fly across the moon or other parts of the sky while they were stargazing. Scientists today speculate that Bonilla may have observed the explosion of a large comet that was perhaps very close to hitting our planet. But UFO enthusiasts contend that these images are the very first UFO photos in history. If it was an explosion of a comet, why did they dart around as if intelligently controlled? But Maybe Bonilla, seeing so many objects at once, misperceived their movements. I guess there's really no way to know for sure what he saw. But back to the airships in the United States. There's a large rash of airship sightings between the 1860s and 1890s, but particularly 1896 and 1897. These were reported from coast to coast in droves as unidentifi unidentifiable lights, metallic spheres, and some people even claimed to see people inside of these crafts. It began in California with people reporting sightings of what they described as mysterious large dirigibles. Now, dirigibles were invented quite a few years before this, so I would imagine most people would know if they were looking at a dirigible operated by totally normal humans. Because these witnesses claimed they could see people in these large dirigibles and they, that they looked kind of human but wore strange or unusual clothing. In one story, 
the people told them they were straight up from Mars. But bear with me, I'm going to get into the rampant yellow journalism in this whole era in a few. But as a side note, I'm just saying, if I was a time traveler, I would definitely go to the 1800s and tell people I was from Mars. In Oakland, California, on November 26, 1896, at around 8 p.m., people claimed to see a, quote, great black cigar. The body was at least 100 feet long and attached to it was a triangular tail one apex being attached to the main body. The surface of the airship looked as if it were made of aluminum. The airship went at a tremendous speed, end quote. So here we have a possible early incident of the famous cigar-shaped UFO that has been so widely reported in modern times. In Sacramento, around the same time, people claimed to see a 100-foot-long metallic craft that landed in a field. Three seven-foot-tall humanoid-like beings exited the craft, and attempted to talk to the witnesses with strange warbling noises. The fact that they're described as warbling noises does kind of get to me, because that's also what people describe today, and in the most recent past even. So, I don't know, that's kind of interesting. But they claim the strange beings tried to force them into their ship. They used the word kidnap, but somehow they were able to get away. It's just weird that this kind of story is happening in the 1890s. I don't know what to make of it. However, as we'll see, this also coincides with the beginnings of modern-day sci-fi. Shortly after, people in Texas claimed to experience the same thing, but they were described as hot, naked aliens, and we all wish we would have been there. Yes, even back then, humans have been wanting to, quote, clap some alien cheeks, as one of my followers put it. Moreover, there were already reports of cattle mutilations coinciding with these mystery airship events, especially in Texas and the American Southwest. Jumping back over to Nebraska, in February 1897, a cone-shaped UFO was seen hovering over a prayer group. They claimed it had a headlight, three smaller lights on each side, and two wings. One local newspaper stated, The now famous California airship inventor is in our vicinity. Now, I'm sure not everyone's mind in the 1800s was blaming these crafts on aliens or thought they were alien in nature. Remember, this is America and the 1800s, after all. Lots of religious folk and typically conservative religious folks aren't very into the idea of life on other planets. This newspaper clipping suggests that maybe people thought there was some elaborate hoaxer or perhaps an eccentric inventor who was responsible for this. In nearby Kansas, we have cattle mutilations reported around the same time, with one frustrated cattle rancher claiming that he saw, quote, hideous creatures who carried off his calf in his ship and then flew away in an airship. Jumping continents again, let's head over to Burnbrook, England in 1901. A 10-year-old boy claimed to see what he described as a box, and these box UFOs or cube UFOs have been reported today and have also been reported by U.S. Air Force pilots. The little boy claimed he saw two small men exit the craft, and they appeared to be in what looked like military uniforms of some kind. They were wearing caps with wires sticking out of them. When they emerged from the craft, they waved for him to go away. Watching from a distance, the boy claimed he saw the craft fly off in a flash of light. Now, you may be thinking, okay, kids have wild imaginations, and yes, of course they do. But this is a rather weird story, so I thought it was worth mentioning. They may have wild imaginations, but they also have next to no filter, and they are willing to believe in just about anything, especially if it's something they saw with their own eyes. But we don't know this kid. He could have been a fan of telling tall tales. In 1904, and I know we're getting out of the 1800s at this point, but it's still pre-Roswell and still pretty interesting. So in 1904, large metallic objects were seen off the coast of San Diego maneuvering rapidly. And this story was so similar to what military personnel in San Diego have claimed to see, I think, just a few years ago. In 1907, a torpedo-shaped object was spotted off the East Coast, followed by a metallic sphere. And this one is also strange because so many modern-day UFO sightings describe that there will be one UFO that is one shape and another smaller UFO trailing behind it. This next story is perhaps one of the most intriguing and one of the most well-known. On April 17, 1897, an alleged unknown aircraft crashed on a farm near Aurora, Texas. Not only that, witnesses claimed they found a being inside, 
who unfortunately did not survive the crash. They then buried the small being at Aurora Cemetery, and in the news report, it said that multiple people in the area had been seeing this airship for a couple days leading up to the event. But on this particular day, it was seen flying much lower than previously seen. The journalist stated, evidently some of the machinery was out of order. They say that debris was scattered throughout the area and that the crash produced a terrific explosion. Upon examination of the body, it was determined the occupant was, quote, not an inhabitant of this world. They said they found papers with hieroglyphic writing and that the wreckage seemed to be some kind of unknown metal which they dumped in a nearby well. Now, you might be thinking, first of all, this story is crazy, and second of all, if there's an alien buried there, why haven't we gone and dug it up yet? So I swear I remember on TV a long time ago, I saw this thing about the crash in Aurora, Texas. And they included this story about some kid and maybe some of his friends who had tried to dig up the body shortly after, but they saw military people there or people in black suits who had it blocked off and were surrounding the gravesite. And then the guys returned later on to find that the body had been taken. Well, I couldn't find that story online anywhere, so maybe I made it up or whatever I was watching on TV made it up. However, there was a man in the 1930s who lived on the farm of the famous UFO crash. He decided that he wanted to use the well and began clearing it out, doing who knows what with the potential alien spaceship material. But apparently, this guy ended up developing severe and debilitating arthritis in his hands, so much so that they became warped and swollen. Now, for a second, I'd like to remind everyone that this was an era of our history that was rife with what came to be called yellow journalism. It's kind of like our modern day fake news. Stories were purposely sensationalized or in some cases even completely made up. They were written to purposely inspire fear or excitement in order to sell more papers or get people politically enraged in one way or another. This type of journalism did not come without very real consequences. Sound familiar? It's also during this time that newspapers regularly reported real ghost stories. What many people may not know about the late 1800s is that people were getting very into the supernatural. This is when the spiritualism movement happened and when writings from theosophists such as Helena Blavatsky were published. There was a strong underbelly of groups and individuals who became very into things such as aliens, other dimensions, ghosts, divination, and alternative spiritual beliefs in general. And this is a common phenomenon that occurs after traumatic events. In this case, we are talking about a time still processing the trauma of the American Civil War. This is also where the sci-fi genre as we know it is created. H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds was published in 1898. The Time Machine, The Invisible Man, The Crystal Egg, and The First Men in the Moon were written by Wells during this time as well. Jules Verne wrote From the Earth to the Moon in 1865 and Journey to the Center of the Earth in 1870. The idea that perhaps there were things unknown and unexplainable definitely existed during this time, and anyone from theosophists to spiritualists to any old average Joe entertained the idea that life existed elsewhere in the universe. And what if they do come here sometimes? People in the 1800s were just as inquisitive and imaginative as we are today. They just didn't have the resources or technology to make movies about it or podcasts about it. A part of me wonders if pre-Roswell, like maybe somewhere between early 1900s and the 1940s, we had forgotten this part of our history that was so rife with all these mystery airship stories and alien stories, UFO stories, and kind of rec are recreating it now. In, um, we did it in the 20th century and we are in the 21st century. Maybe in the 1800s, this was a big deal that people were talking about. Maybe they were talking about alien abductions or kidnappings or seeing different types of UFOs. And there was all these sensationalized stories about it like there are today in our society. Like, as much as I believe in aliens and UFOs, I know that a bunch of people who come forward with these stories are either lying or exaggerating or very much mistaken. I know that there's only probably a kernel of truth to like 10% of alien and UFO stories, but still, that 10% is rather convincing. So, I don't know, that's just a little theory I have. 
But I'd like to talk about a couple more stories. So in Hamburg, Germany, in June of 1914, people claimed to see what they described as dwarves who were four feet tall near a cigar-shaped vessel that had lighted portholes. And those lighted portholes, or just portholes in general, are still commonly reported today. They claim that these beings were just milling around until they took off in their ship, again at a tremendous speed, seemingly in an instant. Jumping back to the States, in Detroit in 1922, a couple claimed to see a large disc hovering over them. Now, there wasn't much about the story, but my first question was, okay, this is Detroit. Wouldn't so many people have seen this as well? So I don't know what to make of it or if I can find it credible. But even more unbelievable, they claimed to see about 20 bald-headed beings staring at them. Now, the bald-headed beings part is interesting just because that's how gray aliens are described these days, but who knows. I kind of want to call grays bald-headed beings from now on. So what do y'all think? If you ask me, there's weird stuff up there flying around in our skies. And if you ask plenty of modern U.S. Air Force pilots, they will tell you there's plenty of stuff up there that they can identify and that do not make sense to them. But what if it's kind of always been there? Maybe post-nuclear weapons, the activity or interest these things have in us just ramped up. People have always, throughout the recorded history of human civilization, human beings have always claimed to see things in the sky that they couldn't totally explain. As of now, whatever they are, and after possibly thousands of years of sightings, we still cannot say, beyond a shadow of a doubt, what they are. So my question to you guys is, what do you think? With these mystery airships, was it just an issue of yellow journalism or did the beginnings of modern sci-fi influence these stories? Or do you think there might be some truth in the idea that they may have been of an otherworldly origin? Let me know on Instagram or on the Facebook group, or you can email me at paranormalcommunitycollege at gmail.com. So that's the end of this episode, guys. Hope you enjoyed it. Let me know if you've come across any other incidences pre-Roswell. And as always, thank you so much for listening. Next time, we're talking about Bigfoot. So until then, take care, everyone, and I hope you have a happy 4th of July.